I, I am going to respect you as a professional, and I'm going to respect the fact that you got up at four o'clock this morning, got in your truck, came to the job site, and you're here to feed your family. I, I have the utmost respect for that. And, and, let's, and, I, and I also have respect that you've been doing this for a long time. Today, I'm excited to welcome Andrew Pylon to the show. Now, um, Andrew and I first, um, I guess, crossed paths uh, many, many years ago <laughs> as he was a, a young uh, college intern at uh, a company called FlowServe. And as it turns out, prior to my Gimba Academy career there, I, I worked for, for FlowServe as a um, I'm in their continuous improvement movement uh, out of the sort of the headquarters there in Irving, Texas. And anyhow, I would travel over to the Sulphur Springs plant in, in Texas here and and support that plant from time to time, running different Kaizen events and so forth. And ends up, Andrew was one of these interns running around and and uh, supporting us on these events. So we had a lot of fun reminiscing back on back in our old days at, over there at FlowServe. So that was a, that was good. Um, but now Andrew um, actually works more in, in, in the construction industry and, and he's heavily uh, involved, sort of been practicing lean as he's, as he's doing his work. And so today on the podcast, we kind of talk about um, how they're using different things like this last planner system, which many, many lean construction folks are familiar with, basically sort of kind of like project management for lean construction, but with lots of input from the various subcontractors contractors and so forth. And then we had a really interesting conversation on what respect for people means in the construction industry. And uh, yeah, it was, there was some really cool stuff and it's not all, you know, singing Kumbaya and being you know sweet with each other. It's not necessarily all about that. So Andrew does a good job um, summarizing that. So yeah, really fun episode. I think you're going to like it. Show notes can be found over at gimbapodcast.com. Look for episode 464. Um, and also, if you just scroll down on the app, you can you can link up to uh, to Andrew over on LinkedIn and all that kind of stuff. And then also, if you keep going and you and you don't mind uh, leaving us a review, we're really trying to uh, to build that part of the podcast up this year. So yeah, you just got to. It's kind of weird if you're on the Apple Podcast app. You just got to keep scrolling, and then you'll see the stars. You hit that fifth one to the far right. That's what you next. Know, kidding you know if you like us hit us a five star and then put a little put a little comment in there and uh, I, I read them all and I'm actually thinking about if we start getting some more traction on that and maybe I'll read a few of them out loud on the podcast so anyhow appreciate it and uh, enough for me let's get to the show Andrew welcome to the show how's it going man hey thanks Ron it's good to be here all right where are you calling in from Fort Worth Texas all right right down the road I'm over here in Keller so got a little ice yeah, we're enduring the storm together. Yeah. <laughs> Do you have any issues or anything like that? <clears throat> had a power outage this morning. Thank goodness we had a backup generator. So, oh man, it's fine. Do you have the uh, interlock switch on your house and all that where you can plug it in and all that? So, yeah, I installed a uh, breaker switch. It's just a, a cutover switch, basically. Yeah. Uh, it's not an automatic transfer switch, but it, which is fine. So a small little Costco tri fuel generator, uh -huh. and away we go. Yeah, yeah. I got the same thing. I, I got the you know electrician come out, and he, so I can like plug mine into the side of the house, or whatever. You know, get a little deal in the breaker box where you got to flip it down, where you can't turn the main breaker back on, and all that. Oh, yeah. But uh, we didn't lose power. You know, I don't know if it's good to say that I was wanting to lose power because I wanted to try it. You know, <laughs> but, yeah. but we didn't. So anyhow, maybe maybe next time, right? They'll, I'm sure there'll be a next time. It's always I don't know what it is about February and ice around here, but it's it's hitting us. The good news is that spring starts on Friday. Right. Exactly. <laughs> exactly. Well, we had, was it two, I think it was two years ago. Yeah. yeah. Around this time, right in February with that, that crazy, the crazy one, when it came through, we actually here in our, our studio here, um, our building, we had a pipe burst in the wall and flooded the whole building and oh my word, it was a mess, man. But we, we made it through. So <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Yeah, we we always get that February ice or snow. Yeah, then everything turns green. Yep, got it, got it. All right. Well, hey man, I, I know you've listened to the show, Andrew. And we like to uh, get things going with a quote. So, what do you got? Yeah. So my quote, and I uh, I would hate to misattribute it to the original uh, author, but I I believe it was from uh, Winston Churchill, who said, uh, "Plans are useless, but planning is everything." Hmm. What do you think that means? Yeah. So, and I, when I first heard it, I think it, it ties right back into Mike Tyson's quote uh -huh. of everyone has a plan 
until you get hit in the mouth. Right. Uh, I think it's the same thing, but the, uh, the, the mental work prior to embarking on any endeavor is absolutely mandatory. Yeah. Uh, you don't have to have the perfect plan, but you have to have plan yeah. and, and prepare yourself for every contingency. Right. Right. Awesome. All right. Well, hey, man, tell us a little bit about yourself, Andrew. Tell us about your background, how you first got into all this continuous improvement stuff, and then tell us what you're up to these days. Yeah, absolutely. So, Ron, my background really, really starts the first time I met you, and that was 10 years ago. No, sorry, 13 years ago at, in Sulphur Springs, Texas <laughs> yep. at the FlowServe valve manufacturing plant. Yep. I was an intern manufacturing engineer, yep. uh, studying manufacturing engineering at Texas A&M, working for a guy named Tony Hooks. Oh, yeah. <laughs> I don't know if you remember Tony. Yeah. Oh, yeah. Man, I haven't talked to Tony yeah. in a few years. Now I, I need to reach out to him, see what kind of trouble he's up to lately. Yeah. yeah, I think he's moved. I don't know where he is now. I think he's moved from FlowServe. Oh, yeah. No, he's gone from FlowServe. I know that. Yeah. 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 And so I was uh, a, what, 21-year-old college student living in uh, this rancher's barn <laughs> okay. in Cooper, Texas, not too far from Sulphur Springs, working eight hours a day at FlowServe doing what I could to help around the factory or whatever, but I was most basically there to be a sponge. Mm -hmm. um, but, you know, I didn't really have a capstone project. Uh, they really just wanted me to look, listen, and understand as much as I could. So I was grateful for it. Um, you know, immediately upon completing the internship, I, I thought, gosh, what a waste of time. I spent, I spent all my time just sitting at a desk, walking around the factory. I, I, I wasn't really sure what I got out of it. But years down the road, I constantly look back at that internship and remember the lessons I learned from you, from Tony, and most importantly, from the people on the floor doing the work mm -hmm. um, and the sort of change implementation project we were working on there. And we could get into that a little later. Yeah. But, um, but yeah, it's it's kind of funny how you at the time you might think you're not learning anything, but then you look back and you have a whole treasure chest of lessons. Do you remember what what the uh, what the event was? What what were we working on? I do. It was so it started with a, a gimbal walk, followed by a kaizen event, and um, I think the plant manager, this guy named Drake Clark had a few th stations that were bottlenecks for him. Yeah. I just talked to Drake. It's so funny. You say that. I just literally really? talked. I just talked to Drake like a week ago. He called me out of the blue. He's at, you know, some other place asking me some questions or whatever, but that's hilarious that you mentioned Drake. It is. And I had a funny connection to Drake as well. Drake's wife was a cheerleading coach at my high school in Tulsa, Oklahoma. Oh my gosh. Just wild. But uh, but anyway, Drake had these, he had bottlenecks in his factory, and one of them was a I think it was a fifty two inch uh, plug valve body grinding station. Okay, so a massive plug valve um, with a a grinding head. Uh, I think it was a medium, it wasn't the final finish, but it was uh, they would get these castings. These these valve bodies were cast overseas. They came back and they would go through several finishing processes before they would actually fit the plug in the valve and, you know, and complete the product. But one of the stations was a uh, grinder and they just had a heck of a time getting the valve body located perfectly so the grinder could do its thing. And you know, really that was kind of the first lesson and opened my eyes into one of the, where, I guess, principles or learnings of lean where you want settings and not adjustments. Mm. And the problem there was they had a, a locator plate to locate the valve body, but it wasn't very precise. And it was, it was quite difficult to get the valve body into the grinding machine itself. And so we spent an entire day just racking our brains, thinking about how we could do it better. And I forget how we actually improved it, what, what the actual adjustment was. But we went from something like 45 minutes setup time to a few minutes, maybe mm -hmm. 10. Mm -hmm. uh, it was for me, just being a part of that event was at the time, 
you're going back to this. I feel like I didn't get anything out of it, but later I yeah. didn't realize the impact at the time, you know, it was another Tuesday. <laughs> we were just having a meeting, mm-hmm. uh, but looking back, you know, now that I understand more of the business case of what we did, I mean, we saved hundreds of thousands of dollars yeah. just by doing that one event. Yep. Man, we had a lot of fun in that factory, man, back in the day. Boy, we, he, uh, I would, you know, I, I was with the corporate group in FlowServe at the time. And, but I would, uh, Sulphur Springs was an hour and a half away from maybe from Irving or whatever it was, you know? And, About, yeah. Yeah. And, uh, so I would drive over there, man. We would run these events and go to the Chili's at night. You know, that was, <laughs> that was the big thing, right? Go to the Chili's, you know, that was, <laughs> The uh, Chili's was huge, and everyone in Sulphur Springs <laughs> fought it because they served alcohol. Oh yeah, that was that was yeah. a big deal. Yeah, yeah. I had to drive to Cooper to get beer. Right. <laughs> no, sorry to Commerce. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I had to drive the county over to get the beer. Oh my gosh, good stuff, man. Well, what are you up to these days, then, Andrew? Yeah, so I uh, left college, went into the Marine Corps right after college, uh, became a logistics officer. And actually, my contract with the Marine Corps was to be a reservist from day one. So I did a year of training Mm -hmm. and then went straight into a reserve motor transport company out of Lubbock, Texas, while I was working as a mechanical engineer for Halliburton in Fort Smith, Arkansas. Mm -hmm. So I spent a few years doing that. Uh, Oil field crashed in 2014, 2015. And I moved into construction. Uh, and since then, I've uh, had, had a bit of a transition into construction. It's certainly not manufacturing. Mm. And it's certainly not oil field. Mm. Uh, so I, it's it been, been working through. I started as a, say, I guess, what would I call it? They call it a field engineer. But really, the company I worked for, the field engineer was a pipeline to being a superintendent. And if I do equate a construction superintendent to manufacturing, I would say it is very similar to a plant operations manager okay, or a shift lead mm-hmm. where I own safety quality schedule in that order. And so uh, I really took a lot of what I'd learned at Halliburton and got into more of the mechanical systems of the projects I was on. Mm-hmm. I was building data centers in prior Oklahoma. And then later in Fort Worth, Texas, same client, but a different data center project. Mm-hmm. But we really focus on the mechanical systems in Oklahoma um, and did my best to apply some of the, you know, the lean principles that I learned. Uh, but I, I had really kind of a tough time because construction is, you know, there's a McKinsey study that came out, says construction hasn't improved productivity since about 1968. Mm. If anything, we're going backwards. <laughs> so uh, we, we have not industrialized near to the scale that manufacturing has. Okay. And so uh, when I, as I moved up in the construction company, I started being involved in more and more planning meetings. And that's when I really, the, the Marine officer inside me started to come out mm-hmm. where we're tra- trained from day one, uh, a very strict coordinated and uh, a regimented planning process in addition to a very distinct and clear communication process. And most of the input we get during the planning cycle should come from those who are going to do the work. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. So if if I'm a convoy commander and I'm I'm about to go run a convoy from A to B, I better be talking to my, my drivers my platoon sergeant, the you know the guys who are there on the front line doing the thing to give me the best input and give me the best information I can have mm-hmm. to make the best decision. Mm-hmm. So construction, on the other hand, by and large, is a very much command and control, uh, top down. I'm the superintendent on the job. You're the trade contractor. This is your duration. Figure it out. Mm-hmm. I'll see you in a week. Mm-hmm. And so. What I found when we were building these really complex plans to build these data centers on very compressed timelines was that you had one really smart person in the middle of the room with sort of kind of a one-way downhill conversational style, and everyone else was expected just to shut up and listen. Mm -hmm. Um, 
And that works in certain scenarios where you have a very tight timeline and you don't have time to get input. You just go, 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 go. But it's not sustainable for anywhere past, I would say, a month or two. Mm -hmm. Especially if you're on an 18 month long project, you really need to want to get as much input from your trades as you can, which does two things. Gives you the best information and builds rapport with your people. Mm -hmm. So I found that out uh, as I was starting to be the one who was supposed to make these plans, like moving up at a construction company and just knowing there had to be a better way to do things. And I latched on to this uh, process called last planner system. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Have you, I think if you heard of it. Yeah. We've had some, had some Lincoln construction guys on in the past on the podcast. Okay, and cool. Yeah. 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 Excellent. So I said all of that, that was a bit of a, uh, yeah, no, a that's good. Monologue to, to get to where I am now. Uh, I last on a lean planner system. Um, our, we luckily we had a client who was very invested in that with us. They had actually mandated that we use last planner system as a part of our uh, production planning. Mm -hmm. And they even carved out a bit of the budget for us to have a planning facility, which halfway through the project we hadn't yet built. Mm -hmm. <laughs> and so I got tapped on the shoulder to go design build uh, and run this planning center for excellence on the job site. Mm -hmm. um, it's very fortunate to have been able to have that opportunity. You know, again, looking back, I thought, gosh, I've got to leave running work. You know, I'm doing all right. these important scopes. I'm having so much fun. I'm dealing with cranes and mm -hmm. all this. And, but now I've got to go build a facility and, and do some, uh, you know, kind of academic type planning and, and uh, process implementation. Mm -hmm. But I, yeah, I welcomed it. Yeah. The, I'm curious, like just for folks, like I'm, I'm not a hundred percent sure myself and I'm sure people listening aren't either. T talk a little bit about last planner. I mean, it, I mean, yeah. is it project management for construction or, you know, is it like Gantt charts and, you know, that sort of thing or what, what is it? Yeah. I would say it's not so much a, an output as it is a means to facilitate inputs. So last planner is the way I describe it and see it. And you know, I'm sure the, the lean community might have their own opinions about it, but my opinion about last planner is it is a structured means of planning and communication with a focus on pulling the best ideas from the people who are doing the work. Okay. So, so someone's building a, well, maybe this is a bad example because it's more residential. I don't know. Maybe your stuff is more commercial, but someone's putting a swimming pool in their backyard. Right. Yeah. And so they say, Hey, yeah, y'all have a swimming pool by May, by May. And you know, and it's, and it's November or something. I don't know. Right. And, yeah. and so how's last planner going to work there with, with putting a swimming pool in? Exactly. So instead of me, if I'm the superintendent for that particular project, just building a schedule in Excel saying, here you go, subs, y'all better figure it out. It. This is what you have. Yeah. 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 Away you go. This is all I'm allotting you. Um, before I do that, we have a very intentional conversation where we think about the job together, where I'll put a milestone or two on the board and say, okay, look, if we're going to build this thing permitting, by this day as a superintendent, I should know all the permits I need, mm -hmm. but I need to have that conversation with my trades too, because they might know, well, Hey, actually in this area or in, or in yeah. this, this city, you've got to go talk to this guy. And that takes four weeks. Mm -hmm. Right. And so I'm at, we're thinking through the job together. We're doing, it's basically a, a structured way to do a thought experiment about the project before we start. Mm -hmm. And so, that's that's really how I would describe now, it. Now it does assume just, that you know who all your subs are at the time, right? Correct. Are going to yeah. be. And I I mean it's been yeah. my experience, you know, even when we built the building here at our Gamba Academy building, I mean, that was a painful process, my gosh. And uh <laughs> and you know, it's almost as if do you even know who the electrician's going to be next month? You know, I mean, they probably did, but like on the swimming pool example, I had a buddy who had one in and I can tell you for sure they didn't necessarily know who was going to come do the gunite. Right. Like they had three yeah. or four guys and they were going to say who's available or something like that. Right. And yeah. so, 
uh, residential, you can kind of play the shell game a little bit because uh, it's it's so dependent on weather. Uh, it's so much more dependent on just, I, I guess, the continuity of yeah. projects and how fragmented that that industry is. Right. Where people are just going to plug holes where they can. No one is actually focused on generating a production system. Right. The bigger home builders do. Maybe, maybe like Dior Horton has their has a system down where they know for a certain kind of house footprint or floor plan with this many crews, they can build six at a time. And right. Sort of and they probably projects. have their own subs, right? Like that, that work for DR Horton, I assume. Right. Or, or yeah. Or, or preferred subs, negotiated subs, people yeah. they have good relationships with. Yeah. So, okay. So you get up basically, so it sounds like you're building a project plan with the, with the key folks who are part of the project, getting their feedback early and often. And I guess probably as you're going through and you're, con, you're continuing to update the model, if you will. Right. So that your inputs are, are accurate as you go. Is that, is that fair? That's right. Yeah, that's exactly fair. Uh, so generally how it works from you build the larger skeleton of the plan first. So just like you build a house, mm -hmm. you have to build a foundation. And within last planner, that foundation really is respect for people. Mm -hmm. That's the first thing you actually have to establish. <laughs> I know, you know we can get into the tactics of planning and, and you know how we build our our, our, our face plans and, mm -hmm. and then we get into weekly work plans and all that. But before we can even walk down that road, you have to establish that respect for peace, people. Um, What's that look I've, like in the construction industry? Respect for your gosh. electrician or your, you know what I mean? Or your painters yeah. or. <laughs> yeah. Uh, different people have different approaches. I, I don't go the touchy feel you're out of, uh, you know, I want to know your emotions mm -hmm. and I want to know your kids' names. I, honestly, I really don't care. <laughs> like, let's, let's get this job done. Yeah. <laughs> But I, I am going to respect you as a professional and I'm going to respect the fact that you got up at four o'clock this morning, got in your truck, came to the job site and you're here to feed your family. Yeah. I, I have the utmost respect for that. Yeah. And, and let's, and I, and I also have respect that you've been doing this for a long time and that you've chosen this as your profession. Mm -hmm. So when you tell me something is going to take five weeks, I'm going to take that at face value and I'm not going to instantly call BS. I might ask you a few questions and I might try to understand. And I might, and we might come to where if, you know what, you forgot something and it's three weeks. But if, if we, in the course of that conversation, I find out you initially overestimated it's because you forgot. I'm not going to hold that against you. And I'm not going to say, oh, well, that guy doesn't know what he's doing. We're all here, right? <laughs> we're all yeah. human. Mm -hmm. uh, we're all the man in the arena right now. Mm -hmm. So that's what that establishing respect looks like, mm -hmm. first and foremost. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. So how do you handle, you're in the middle of a project and, you know, we're supposed to be at this particular milestone and we're not there. And maybe it's, maybe it is due to, you know, effort or, <laughs> or competence or whatever. I don't know. Like, wh how, how do you, what do you do though in that situation? So I, uh, and so now you're, you're kind of talking about, I'm going to go back to an example. Uh, so I, I practiced jujitsu and, uh, we had a student ask the coach the other day, well, what, what do I do if I get to this spot? And his first answer was don't get to that spot. Mm. <laughs> and so I would say for that the way you, and the way you head that off to where you don't get to that spot is where you look at the project every single day. Yeah. And which is a part of last planner. There's a very sort of strict process by which you do that. Mm -hmm. Got it. Got it. So what other kind of lean concepts have you, uh, aside from last planner, what, what, what other stuff? I mean, is it visual management or anything like that? Like what, what are you guys doing on a construction site? Yeah, visual management is huge. Uh, there's a study, gosh, one of my, it's actually one of my HVAC contractors brought to me and, and talked to me about it and showed me everything. He said, most people in construction are either visual or kinesthetic learners. Very few are auditory learners. You have to show someone in construction. That's just how we're wired as an mm -hmm. industry. Mm -hmm. um, and so I, I took that information and made a visualization on the wall 
of, of the drawings in the project. So if, if I was running site work at the time on the big data center here in Fort Worth, where I'm, I'm cutting under roads and I've, I've got to close things down and I've got a lot going on at once, I have to make that very visual for my crews. And the way we did that was with a full size set of drawings, which is what, 40 by 48 inches mm. laminated. Okay. And everyone had their own color of dry erase marker. So we were in that morning huddle. It was part of last planner. We're talking about the work for that day and the, and the handoffs and the promises we're making to each other. We're marking out where we're going to be working that day. We're solving conflicts before we get out to the field and say, Oh no. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. Uh, and the next step with that is something I'm working on is to digitize that visualization. So sort of a tableau for construction, mm-hmm. if you will. Mm-hmm. Uh, where if you're planning in a digital platform, every the, that plan automatically populates in the form of custom polygons overlaid on a set of drawings. So we can all immediately see where we're going to be. Uh, but I've, as I've found with these visualizations, the meeting focused not on the Gantt chart that I created for the plan, but the entire meeting focused on the visualization of what we're doing. Hmm. And my job at that point was to make sure that the conversation was captured in the digital planning platform. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Now, what about like some, you know, basic and think back to our flow serve days, you know, we were going after the the seven ways and practicing five S all over the place and that sort of thing. Some of the blocking and tackling of lean, how does that play in, in what you guys are doing? Yeah. So looking, really looking at eliminating waste, uh, really everywhere we can. Uh, the one that I'm focused on now is supply chain waste. So there's a project you've probably driven past it uh, right by Top Golf in Fort Worth. Uh-huh. Uh huh. Just west of the Top Golf, there's a multifamily residential project going on with right. with uh, you know CMU elevator shafts. Okay. They bought all of their lumber way up front on the job. Okay. Because they got a cheaper price point, which I get it. Supply chain, you know. The nature of what we're dealing with right now, fine, but all that lumber has been sitting there for four months. Mm. (laughs) An immense amount of waste in in stored material and in material waiting on work. So really looking at how do we tie planning back to supply chain and manage our supply chains more intelligently. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. That's where a lot of the waste in construction comes from Mm -hmm. because it's a fragmented and uh, converging supply chain Mm -hmm. where the final product is the building itself. It doesn't go anywhere beyond that. Right. Uh, And so it's, uh, gosh, uh, Dr. Ruben Vrihoff out of, gosh, where is he out of Sweden? I I wrote a blog post on a paper he wrote where he he really does a good job describing construction supply chains Mm -hmm. and the reason for a lot of the problems we see. And so that's, that's really where my focus has been lately. I even went to grad school for it. Wow. <laughs> As long as construction, I just finished uh, in December uh, here in TCU. Nice. And just focusing on supply chain to better understand it because I think that's where the next breakthrough is in construction. Right, right. Right. Very cool. Hey, so last question, if, if someone's listening to this right now, maybe they're in the construction industry or, you know, something semi-related to that and may want to, they're wanting to sort of dip their toe into this whole continuous improvement arena, as you called it earlier. Like what, yeah. uh, what advice do you have for them? Yeah. Start with a process. Uh, I mean, I work for a software company. I, I, I'm working for the software company I used as a superintendent. I love software. It's great. Don't start with software. Software will not solve your problems. Only process with the foundation of respect for people will solve your problems. Mm. So start there. Nice. <laughs> and nice. they call me. Yeah. Well, yeah. I mean, don't automate waste, right? You know, I mean, that's, that's what right. happens when we run the software right out of the gate. We're just automating that's waste. Right. So yeah. Wonderful. Hey, if folks want to connect with you, Andrew, um, maybe some of our old Sulphur Springs friends are wanting to reconnect, you know, Drake is out there wondering where Andrew is. Well, what's the best way to, to connect? Yeah. Get a hold of me. I'm on LinkedIn. Andrew Pyland, uh, or reach out to me, a Pyland at touchplan.io. I work for Touchplan, mm-hmm. a last planner digital platform, which 
doubles as an operations management platform and it saves you a lot of time. It pays for itself in two months. Nice. And, <laughs> Thanks and, for the plug, Ron. Yeah, yeah, that's all good. <laughs> um, and uh, and GembaAcademy.com. No, just kidding. <laughs> <laughs> Pyland is P-I-L-A-N-D, right? Yep. Yeah, Andrew right. Pyland. Yeah, and we'll, we'll ever just scroll down on your app, whatever you're listening to, and we'll have everything linked up to uh, to connect with Andrew. So, hey, man, I appreciate it. And it was fun thinking about the, those old old uh, flow serve days. Maybe we'll have to have a reunion up at the Chili's or something, you know? <laughs> I think so. I'd be all about it. Before awesome. Man. All right. Take care, man. Thanks for listening. Whether you've been on the continuous improvement journey for many years, or perhaps you're just getting started, Gemba Academy is here to support you. And while we're best known for our more than 1500 Lean and Six Sigma teaching and virtual tour videos, we also have a team of experienced Lean and Six Sigma practitioners available for one-on-one coaching, as well as a variety of Lean and Six Sigma certification options. To learn more and to schedule a demo, head on over to GembaAcademy.com.